basically what I'm going to do is go through um, the Clojure library, the actual Google Clojure library. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges of that for those that would want to build libraries in Clojure Skip might actually face. Um, and we're going to look at a little bit of code and I'll talk about a few other things. All right? So, let's start. All right. If you're going to build a Clojure Script library, first question you're going to ask is, what should I build? All right? This is the part I can't help you with. All right? <laughs> this is yours. What I can say is, we had a tool shop, a toolbox on the client, and now we have a machine shop. And there's a big difference with this. And if you look, this is a simple case of where we're basically mocking a single test using Google's testing framework. I could have used Jasmine. It doesn't look any different. Um, but we now have the capability to do something like that. That's actually Midgey uh, and the structure it is. Now, think about the differences between that and that. For those of us who came from the Java world, this was sort of our first step when we walked into Clojure and all of a sudden saw what it could do and how much of the boilerplate suddenly could vanish. Um, the same thing applies in the client world. We now have tools that we never had before. Libraries that instead of thinking in the old way, we now basically sky's the limit. Um, basically building libraries is about building tools. So having this machine shop is extremely important to libraries. And that includes macros. Macros are not something that you want to use all the time, but clearly the fact that we have macros makes library development a much more powerful thing. If we look in here, first thing you want to do is choose your materials. You're a carpenter. All right, you're going to build something. You want to choose your materials. In ClojureScript, we have basically four different kinds of materials. Uh, we have basically the Google libraries. Um, those, uh, we also have these what we call Google Closure third-party libraries, which are actually bundled with the Google libraries, but aren't necessarily in, injected into the compiler uh, with Closure Script. And then we have what's called foreign compatible libraries, which I don't actually know of a single one. Um, so, and then the last one is non-standard libraries. And what falls into that things are things like jQuery and others. And if you stay, go over to Focus's talk next, um, you will see, um, you will see kind of why maybe jQuery and some of the other ones don't, aren't compatible with the thing. So if we look, the first four are compatible. This below here is actually, we have to specify these things on the command line to the compiler. Um, we'll talk a little bit later on how libraries, this can be a problem. All right, first, okay, Rich is in the room. So who's brave enough to say when they said he was putting it on Google Closure that what in the world was he thinking? <laughs> All right, raise your hand. Nobody's, only one person, and only because he's behind Rich and Rich can't see him. <laughs> All righty, well, I'll raise my hand. I knew nothing about Google Closure. I knew about jQuery, I knew about a Dojo and a couple of others, but I was like, what is this? Um, so why wouldn't people use Google Closure. First one, learning curve is steep, and it is. Um, it's the learning curve, if, for those that came into Closure not from Java, it's very similar to learning curve of trying to learn the JVM. Um, the code base is huge. The API is very broad. It can be disoriented. It's very low level. Um, and it's Java-like. In fact, it's maybe more verbose than Java because you actually have to fully qualify everything. Um, but the code, one of the reasons why you would use it, first and foremost, it's compatible with the compiler. And the Google Closure compiler, um, as you'll hear later on in Focus's talk, is awesome. Um, again, the code base is huge. There is so much in there. And we're going to talk about some of the things that's in there. Um, but I was surprised at all the little details there. Because this thing has been building a lot of the Google apps, a lot of the things that we take for granted that we have to pull together in all these different libraries from all over the place are all right there inside Google Closures. Um, the code base is very well structured and commented. In fact, 
where you can't find documentation in a lot of cases or you can't find examples, it may be the most well-documented code I've seen. Going into the code, it's very readable, uh, and you will need to learn to read it. <laughs> um, Low-level APIs. Actually, this is actually a selling point for it. Um, they make great building blocks for higher-level abstractions. Um, and then it's object-oriented, interface-driven. While it's not interface-driven as in we can extend things, uh, it is interface-driven as in there are certain contracts that you can look at an object and know what properties it has. Uh, it's designed for large-scale development, well-tested and widely used. Well, widely used implies more what apps are widely used, not necessarily Google Closure. As you will see, there aren't a whole heck of a lot of people that are using it. Um, most of the Google apps actually run on this, uh, so it is extremely well tested. Where do you find the code? Well, the code actually looks a lot like the structure for both Clojure and Java. So it's basically the folder structure. I give links in this presentation, and it's online, to the actual API documentation, but the basic structure of the code is structured very similar to how we structure namespaces in, in folder structures. All right, what's in this sink? All right, everything including kitchen sink is in there, so what do we got? Well, the first one here that we're going to talk about, we've already seen DOM CSS. Uh, Dominion actually sits on top of a lot of this. The event management system is actually used with this, the animations. Uh, Closure Script 1 uses, does a very good job of an example of how to use the animation structures that are inside Google Closure. Um, one of the things you'll notice real quick is that the event structure of Google Closures is much more pervasive than the event structures and a lot of other things. Almost everything can be an event target, uh, and that includes things like graphics and other things. Uh, we'll, we'll see. All right, the net and formats. All right, it has a full network type thing, so it can handle, it has things for this XHIO because it's such an awesome name. <laughs> it tells you so much about it. That basically is Ajax. Um, the J JSONP uh, is actually what's showing this. This is actually pulled directly, and I was hoping the wireless would actually work. This was actually pulled from GitHub live. So if somebody wants to go follow one of those, I can actually hit refresh, and this will actually increment. You guys got to move really fast. <laughs> All right. But the iframe IO basically, uh, it, is, it is basically a... a a structure to give you something like WebSockets, but where WebSockets don't exist, and then it has the basic WebSocket stuff. Graphics. This is cool. And like the C2 thing, this is something that I started dabbling in recently, and there's so much you can do with the Google Closure Graphics setup. Uh, that logo is actually written out in JavaScript. Um, and if I can remember which ones the code's at, the basic structure of the code is basically all I'm doing, why is that got a line on it? There we go. Uh, the basic structure code, you can't see any of that, can you? <laughs> Gee, many. All right, well, never mind. Basically, the concept was is I, I turned an SVG file into a basic data structure that, that looked a lot like an SVG file, only in maps and, and vectors. Okay, and then the beauty of the Google Graphics Library is it abstracts SVG, um, VML, and Canvas, and will choose the best one to actually draw. So I don't actually care whether it's drawing an SVG. It'll actually work clear back, in theory, to IE5. Now, if anybody has IE5, I'm more disturbed by that than that. <laughs> I'm actually... Well, later on, I'm going to ask a question about that, but... All right, these are things that I haven't yet played with, um, but the UI is actually the largest library in Google Closure. Um, it's as big as Java Swing in some ways. Um, obviously, building a library on top of that, like Seesaw, would be awesome. Um, there's actually a full editor that's a rich text editor that actually comes with Google Closure that can be extended to do even code editing. Um, 
And then there's basic utility. One thing I did like was the Google Math thing. It actually has stuff in there for matrix, uh, mathematics, vector mathematics, and even some statistics stuff buried inside it. All righty. Next, let's talk about third-party tools. Because this is something that I ended up using and not even knowing it. Because the very first time I started playing around with no, or and that is Chris Granger's thing. And one of the first things it says is replace the Google jar in, wow, we are going to turn that on. All right. Basically, and he had me, re one of the instructions was to replace the Google jar in the closure ship lib. Well, then I went and started building in focus. And first thing, I'm like, wow, I have Google DOM query, which actually is Dojo's query selector. It does CSS3 selectors. It's the same one that's in Dominion. Um, by accident, I actually chose to use the Google Closure to try to reduce the having to tell somebody what the dependencies were. And it turns out I actually still had to tell them what the dependency was. Um, Google Stream, there's actually a full HTML parser. And I'm fairly certain in this room, no one's using Silverlight, but you never know. All right. All right. Externs and foreign libs. As I said, foreign libs, I have yet to find one, at least that I'm aware of. If you do know of some, um, they can be specified. But Dojo's the only one, and with some hacking, in theory, it can be a foreign lib uh, and actually be compatible with there. But there is no major. JavaScript library that is actually compatible with the Google Closure compi compiler. All of them use some basic structures, and you'll see later on what those structures are if you sit through Fogus's talk. Um, but they all use structures that can't work with the compiler, so we have to use them as externs, which as externs basically means that we pull them in separate. So we, we basically compile everything that is inside that works with the Google Closures, and then we pull in this separately, and you have to actually place uh, the file inside um, your app's a script tag. Okay? But the question is, what's the cost? Because there's been a lot of things that we shouldn't wrap jQuery, or we shouldn't wrap this because it's not compatible. We should be using Google Closures. So what I did was I'm like, OK, I need to know the cost. All right. So I built a simple app. Now, this simple app has things like um, form validation. So I basically have to put in a name here. And if I don't put in a valid email address, it doesn't like it. So I have to at least fool it and you know, play pretend. Twitters have to start with nat sign. So it might help if I could type. So hit submit, and it automatically. I would show you the code, but it's, you can't see it anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Um, but it's basically a backbone style app that we kind of see. It basically uses an atom with validators and watchers. So basically, there's a, a watcher that sits there and waits for it to change, that changes this little content piece. And then the validator is actually what's driving the validation of the form. Uh, it's using a protocol for basically the form object so it can hold a message and stuff so we can actually give messages back and stuff. Um, so I built this using both JackQ and in focus. It turns out they were exactly the same number of lines. Well, that's because they're both selector-based systems. They look almost identical when you actually use them. Uh, same thing if I did use Dominion. Uh, in focus provides some other basic things. It's just a higher level abstraction over these. Um, but in essence, for something this simple, it was just some, it looks very similar to using uh, Jake, I guess is what it's called. Uh, so I wanted to see what the actual thing. This is actually what it came out to. Um, basically, the top red, the red parts, uh, the actual jQuery lib, and this is the compiled closure script. Okay? It turns out that it was about 50K larger for the app. But there's one key point. Really? And Chris Granger makes this point for Jake. Really, that should probably be cached. 
Um, which does say that, in reality, if you did cache this, because it's not bringing in the event structure and a lot of the other things, it actually turns out to be smaller. Now, if you're using it in an app that has lots of different libraries, the odds of that being smaller are probably slim, because other, other libraries are probably going to bring in the Google Closure stuff. Um, but what this is basically saying is, people should not shy, I don't think, away from wrapping or using libraries that are externs to build your libraries. Now, the people using the libraries have to understand the cost, but nobody should be smacking anybody's hand. Um, all right, managing upstream dependencies. So now you've chosen all your materials. All right, next thing is I had to write instructions on how somebody should use and focus. And I realized I was telling them the parameters to put in the actual compiler. And I'm like, oh, that feels bad. Well, first question, should users have to worry about upstream dependencies? Anybody want to answer? No. No. Used to be we always had to. I mean, up until Maven, Lightigan, and all those, we had to worry about managing upstream dependencies. We've gotten very used to not. Uh, in fact, if we have to, we get grumpy. At least I do. So. There's an experimental feature now in ClojureScript that actually allows library developers to actually specify what their external dependencies are and actually either include them in a jar or in a dependent jar because it loads stuff off the class path or off zip files. This is nice because it makes the instructions on how to use yours stick this in your, your project file. That's all it does. All right. Challenges of working in a language that's six months old. When I made this slide, it was six months old. It's seven months old now, sorry. <laughs> um, but certain challenges come. Uh, basically, when I started on the journey to write in focus, uh, first thing I noticed was Google. While it may know the answer to life, universe, and everything is 42, it does not know, and as my daughter will put it, anytime that I can't answer a question, she says, go ask the Google. Well, the Google does not know closure trip. <laughs> Odds are, if you're doing a library, you're going to run in situations where you're the first person to ever do that. <laughs> and you just have to deal with it. There is no way around it. Uh, there are certain challenges, and the fact that you're all in here and at a closure conference, the odds are this doesn't scare you. Um, challenges continue. All right. Does anybody know what this logo is actually for? All right. This is the RTFM logo. <laughs> Documentation lags implementation, so nobody should ever tell you to do that. <laughs> um, it's true. And this is just because so much is, is changing. People are working on things. The documentation that's out there isn't nearly in line with what reality is. If they try, I mean, we, we do try, but it isn't. So a lot of times you end up, blog posts are out of date, and people fix them, which is nice, but it takes time. Next thing, bugs. While they are rapidly becoming endangered species, you still run into them. Uh, and we, I have. And I think that probably if you do any exist decent sized library, you're going to run into something. Um, and our, our favorite, IE. How many people use IE in here? Wow. All righty. There are. Oh, yes. When you need to test something. Yes, that's when I use IE also. Uh, it turns out that, that real quick you'll learn that. Most of the closure community does not use Windows. And most of the closure community does not use IE. So most of the examples you even find of closure script don't work in IE. <laughs> and some of the things that may shock people is even the basic functions of alert and set timeout will break. And almost everything starts out with JS slash alert, hello. And it all fits if you're an IE. And the reason being, IE has these native functions that 
don't allow you to use the call method. And ClojureScript is actually largely based on the call method. And there's ways to wrap this and get around it in focus. Turns out that Google Closure almost wraps everything. So you can actually get around most of this stuff by just using the Google Closure library. Um, all right, parting advice. OK. If you're writing a library, words matter. They matter a great deal. Um, I took a shortcut. I took Seagrand's brain, and I built mine on top of him live, because he's way smarter than me. Um, but where I struggled was, there's about 30% of the library where I'm dealing with a dynamic DOM. Wow, that took a lot more thought than I expected. <laughs> like, it's easy, it was easier to write the code than to actually figure out, what do I even call the functions? So that they're intuitive. I mean, because that's the nature of building an API in libraries. Um, you've probably heard this so many times, this conference, that you're getting sick of it. But the belief that libraries should do one thing and one thing only, that we're really looking for composable libraries and not frameworks. Um, and this is partially because ClojureShip's so young, we don't know the right answer. And a framework kind of says, this is the right answer. And I can guarantee you, if you think you know the right answer, you're probably wrong. Because we haven't been doing this long enough. We haven't built enough things. And that goes to the, my next point, eat your own dog food. This whole presentation was actually done using InFocus. All the animations and everything. Um, and in part, the very first thing I built, I built several things with InFocus before I released it. Because it turns out that the APIs were wrong. And until you build something with it, you don't know that. Um, so a lot of people go in, they get excited, and they write a library, push it out, only to have somebody email them back, whoa, what happened here? So I, I suggest you build stuff with libraries before you release them. Uh, documentation, document, this is a pet peeve of mine. Not everybody cares about it. Some people believe people should be able to go in and look at code and say, this is how it should work. But my personal belief, if you release one, you need to document it. Um, and lastly is Josh Blocks. If you haven't read How to Design a Good API and Why It Matters, that's a great thing to start with. Uh, in part because um, Josh Block designed most of the APIs in Java. And while you may hate some of them, the idea that he did that many and he's been beat up that long over them, he knows what he's talking about here. Um, just a little note about what this presentation. Um, it was written in ClojureScript. Uh, it was done using in focus. Uh, and actually, Nathan Nays, who is at Google, uh, he actually let me borrow some of his material from his Google I.O. presentation uh, for some of this stuff. Um, that's it. Any questions? I think I made good time. That worked. Can you talk for a little bit about exactly what in focus is? Yeah. Um, if I could show you some code, that would probably be easier. But since we can't do that, um, the basic structure of it is it's like in live. If you haven't, used, how many people have used in live? If you notice, I had 704 followers. There's only like 59 for in focus. <laughs> so we haven't quite reached the level that that, that Christoph has. But um, basically, the, the idea is we're manipulating raw DOM. So I can bring in external templates and manipulate them like they're part of the DOM. So I basically use selectors and transforms. So And I can chain all the transforms together. It, it makes working with content. So like each one of these slides is a separate HTML file that's just brought in. And actually, I can probably show that. Let me actually see. What's this? That's not it. If we go to, hold up. That's not it. Gee, many. All right, well, basically the idea of this, all right, hold on. Is this it? Yes. If we look here, this is the actual presentation code. And basically, I'm bringing in, you can't really see that. Uh, I can adjust the resolution. That's probably the only way I can do it. 
Like the resin. Hmm? Set. I had, if I, if I was actually in GVIM, I think this will work. I'm not in GVIM, I'm just in VI. So I actually, if I loaded it up in, in that, I could actually blow it up. Or I can, if I just escape out of here, I can actually bring up Eclipse. It may take a second, but <laughs> I use counterclockwise in VIM. I have not yet converted over to Emacs. But the idea is basically it's similar to in live in that it uses <laughs> templates. So instead of like using something like mustache or, or those where, where you're, or hiccup, where you're actually doing closure, you're actually just taking what the designer created, pulling chunks out and using the chunks as is, maybe with some modification. Well, obviously, Eclipse moves fast. So I think it's just going to stop. So. If you want to see outside, I'll actually show you uh, in focus. I can actually give a short demo to people if they want. I mean, it's, it's fairly straightforward. There is a site out there that actually goes through every example. That was one of the first things I built. I did document it very well because it's a pet peeve of mine. So everybody that uses Emacs is laughing at me. I know, because it's just sitting there. <laughs> it's not even working. Okay. Hey, go figure. Alrighty, we're just, all right, is that easier to read? No, it's not, forget it. All right, we're just going to go to, yeah, coffee break, guys. The code didn't work. <laughs>